Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I'm happy to see there are so many survivors who've gone through almost two days of exponential presentations and perspectives and still here. Excellent. I'm going to, uh, I have spent almost 40 years in Silicon Valley, and uh, I'm going to uh, deviate from the traditional Silicon Valley speech. Uh, for those of you who've been there, you'll know that the pres at usual presentation is you start with the demonstration of some amazing new technology, and then the rest of the presentation is all about the extraordinary opportunities that are created by that technology. I'm going to start on a different note. I'm going to focus on what I call the dark side of all of this exponential technology. And by dark side, I don't mean cybercrime, cybersecurity, privacy. There are many issues with the technologies that we've been talking about. I'm going to focus on something that I believe is intrinsic to the technology. We cannot have it, the technology, without this dark side. And the dark side I'm referring to is mounting performance pressure. Mounting pressure on all of us as individuals and as institutions. It takes many different forms. At the institutional level, one form of pressure is the impact of these digital technologies is that we are systematically reducing barriers to entry and barriers to movement on a global scale. Competition is intensifying. There's a second form of pressure, which is this accelerating pace of change. There have been more and more studies done showing that in a variety of, of markets and industries, product life cycles are compressing at a significant rate. It used to be that if you came up with a great new product or service and got it into the market, you could kind of sit back and relax. Victory. Now the question is, so what's next? And how soon can you have that in the market? Because the life cycles are compressing. And as if that weren't enough, there's a third form of pressure, which is all this connectivity we've created on a global scale with this digital infrastructure means that some tiny event in a faraway place in the world that you never heard of quickly cascades into an extreme event, what Taleb calls the black swans, that come in out of nowhere and disrupt our best laid plans and predictions and leave us scrambling to figure out what do we do now. That's a lot of pressure. Intensifying competition, compression of product life cycles, extreme disruptive events coming in out of nowhere. But those are just words. I want to focus on a piece of research we did at the Center for the Edge in the United States. We looked in the United States, we asked, you know, with all this amazing digital technologies, how have companies done? What's been the performance result? We ended up looking at all public companies in the United States, every single one, not a sample, but every one. We, looked, we went back to 1965, a few years before digital technology really came into the business world until today, a period of many decades. And we took as our measure of performance, not a perfect one, but we think good enough, a measure of performance was return on assets. So with all this amazing technology, how have companies done? In the United States from 1965 until today, for all public companies in the United States, return on assets has basically collapsed. It's gone down by 75% over many decades. It's been a long sustained erosion. There are waves that correspond to the short-term economic cycles. But the long-term trend is absolutely clear. And there is no sign of it leveling off, certainly no sign of it turning around. So I believe if you want a measure of mounting performance pressure and our increasing inability to respond to that pressure, 
that's a pretty good indicator. We are in a world of mounting performance pressure. Now, why do I start on such a dark note? A couple of reasons. One reason is I find that many people, when they're exposed to this exponential technology and all the incredible things the technology can do, view it simply as an opportunity. Wow, that's really interesting. You know, but I'm really busy this year. I've got so much going on. Maybe next year, maybe the year after. It's an opportunity. No, one message I hope to leave you with is this is not an opportunity. This is an imperative. And it's not out in the distant future. It is today. It's been going on for decades. And I know this mounting performance pressure is unevenly distributed, and certainly the Greek economy has been experiencing some pretty intense pressure. But unfortunately, my message is it's just going to get more intense. And so I think that sets the stage for what to do about it. But I also, another reason I, I highlight this is because I think we lose sight of a natural human reaction that we all have to mounting performance pressure. And that is fear. And I am struck as I go around the world, I spend most of my time traveling around the world, and regardless of the country, I am struck by the increasing amount of fear that I see in the populations around the world. And I think we need to be very focused on the emotional impact of this mounting performance pressure, not just the economic impact, the emotional impact. Fear has a lot of consequences. One consequence is we tend to maximize our view of risk and minimize our view of reward. <clears throat> we become much more risk averse. We tend to shrink our time horizons. If we're living in fear, we can only focus on today. The future is a distraction. And if we only focus on today, it becomes what economists call a zero-sum view of the world. At the end of the day, the resources are, that are available today are fixed. The only question is who's going to get those resources? Is it going to be me or is it going to be you? Win-lose. And in that kind of environment, trust erodes rapidly. You may seem like a really nice person, but I know at the end of the day, only one of us is going to get these resources. I can't afford to trust you. So I think we need to be very focused on the emotional side of all of this and not just on the theoretical, conceptual uh, side of it. I'm going to focus, it's a huge topic, but I'm going to focus on what I believe is one of the key obstacles to moving out of this mounting performance pressure and addressing the expanding opportunity that is created by the technology. And that obstacle is our institutions all of our institutions. I believe one of the reasons we saw that rapid erosion in return on assets is because our institutions are increasingly not aligned with the world that we're in. There's a disconnect. And I'm going to focus in particular on companies because that's my particular area of focus, but it applies to all institutions, governments, schools, every institution faces the challenges of this disconnect between the world we've been living in and the world we need to address. So, three imperatives for all institutions. One, redefine strategy. Second, reframe innovation. And then third, rethink transformation. Simple. Let me start with strategy. As I mentioned, I come from Silicon Valley and I've spent a lot of time working and, and living with companies, some of the most successful tech companies in Silicon Valley. And I'm struck by the fact that they have a very different approach to strategy than most traditional institutions. 
It goes by many different names. I've come to call it the zoom out, zoom in approach to strategy. This approach focuses on two time horizons in parallel. One time horizon, zoom out, is 10 to 20 years. And on that horizon, the questions are, what is our relevant market or industry likely to look like 10 to 20 years from now? And second, what kind of company will we need to become 10 to 20 years from now to be successful in that market or industry? That's the zoom out. Zoom in, very different time horizon, 6 to 12 months. And on that horizon, the questions are, what are the two or three initiatives, no more, two or three, that we could pursue in the next six to 12 months that would have the greatest impact in accelerating our movement towards that longer-term destination? And second, do we have a critical mass of resources against those two or three initiatives in the next six to 12 months? And finally, how would we determine success? What are the metrics we would use at the end of this period to assess how, how much progress we've made? So, zoom out 10 to 20 years, zoom in 6 to 12 months. When you look at strategy in most traditional institutions, what's the time frame? The five-year plan. Year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. That's our strategy. Interesting observation. In the zoom out, zoom in approach, these companies spend almost no time on one to five years. Their belief is if they get the 10 to 20 year view right and the six to 12 month initiatives right, everything else will take care of itself very different set of time horizons and focus. And I think it's powerful for many reasons. One of them is if we adopt a five-year horizon, you know, we can pretty much convince ourselves that at the end of five years, our company's gonna look pretty much the way it does today. You know, there'll be some incremental change, some modifications, but basically same business, same industry, same company. That's who we are. If you zoom out 10 to 20 years and you truly understand exponential change and you believe you're going to be in the same business as you are today, my advice is go back to the table. It's not over yet. And it forces the leadership out of their comfort zone to challenge the most basic assumptions about the business. That's very powerful. Now, I will also say I've been involved over the years in many cases with what's known as scenario development or scenario planning exercises, where you get the leadership team of a company off onto some retreat, creative retreat. They imagine alternative futures, what the future might look like. They might even pick a, a most probable or most likely future. And then the meeting's over. They go back to work. Nothing changes. It's a really interesting theoretical, conceptual exercise, but nothing changes. In the zoom out, zoom in approach, the meeting is not over until we have identified those two or three initiatives in the next six to 12 months and assured that they have a critical mass of resources. Now, what was a theoretical conceptual exercise becomes very real with consequences tomorrow. Completely changes the discussion and the engagement uh, in, the, in the approach. So I think it's, it's powerful for, also because one of the issues I find when I talk to large institutions around the world is one of the common complaints that I hear in this rapidly changing world we're in is that they're spread way too thin. They have so many initiatives going on and nothing has a critical mass of attention or resource. Zoom out, zoom in forces focus in the short term driven by a sense of destination of where we need to go in the long term.
That's powerful. I believe one of the key issues in a rapidly changing world is maintaining focus. So, very different approach to strategy. Zoom out, zoom in. Um, let me shift to the second imperative, which is this notion of reframing innovation. I will guarantee I've been in leadership meetings of companies and institutions around the world, and I will virtually guarantee that whatever company or institution it is, in somewhere in that leadership meeting agenda is the topic of innovation. It's on every agenda. The challenge is when we get to that item, the conversation very quickly narrows to product innovation and how do we get more creative products into market faster, and that's innovation. In some more sophisticated companies, we might even talk about process innovation, maybe even business model innovation. But that's pretty much where it stops. I want to suggest there's another level of innovation that needs to be on the agenda, but is not. And it's what I call institutional innovation. And the issue here is going back to the most basic question of all, which is, why do we have large institutions? You know, in the course of human history, this was a relatively recent development. There was an economist back in 1937 who tried to answer that question of why we have large institutions. He wrote an essay trying to answer it. It was a pretty good essay. He actually won the Nobel Prize in economics for the essay. His name was Ronald Coase, and at the risk of oversimplifying a very sophisticated perspective, he, his basic answer to the question was because of scalable efficiency. The reason we have large institutions is because it's easier and lower cost to coordinate activity across a large number of people if they're all within one institution. At the time he wrote this essay, Remarkably perceptive and accurate description of what was driving the growth of large institutions around the world. Scalable efficiency. I think the question that needs to be on the table today is, is that rationale from 1937 as compelling today as it was back in 1937? My belief, based on the research we've done, is it is not as compelling and that there needs to be another rationale. We do believe there will be large institutions in the future, but they'll be driven by a very different rationale. Rather than scalable efficiency, the institutions in an exponential world that will be most successful are those that are driven by scalable learning. The reason we will come together in large institutions is because we will learn faster as part of that large institution than we ever could on our own or as part of any smaller organization. In an exponential world, scalable learning is of huge value. If you're not learning faster, you're going to be marginalized. And so I think that that's a very powerful rationale. But it's quite different, and I, I will say one of the reactions I get from executives when I talk about scalable efficiency and scalable learning is, wow, that's very interesting. Scalable efficiency and scalable learning. We'll do both. I want to suggest you can't do both. You have to choose. Which is it? And just as a couple of, of examples of why I believe these are in fundamental conflict, in a scalable efficiency institution, what's the one message that every participant hears almost on a daily basis? Failure is not an option. You will deliver as forecast and predicted reliably and efficiently. Do not fail. Okay, got that message. What's required for learning? Failure. If you're not failing, you're not learning fast enough. Reconcile those two messages. 
fundamental conflict. Think about the environments we've created in the scalable efficiency world. To drive efficiency, we've tightly specified every activity that needs to be performed. We've highly standardized those activities so they're done in the same efficient way throughout the institution. We've tightly integrated all the activities. We've removed all those inefficient buffers that separate activities. Okay. Tightly specified environment, highly standardized, tightly integrated. Where is the room to improvise, to experiment, to test new approaches? There is no room. We've created a prison. It's the reason why when I talk to executives about scalable learning, the conversation immediately shifts to training programs. Oh, we do learning. We have training programs. We take people out of the work environment. We put them in the training room. They can learn all they want. And then they go back into the work environment and do as they're told, without failure, reliably and efficiently. Well, I would suggest that in an exponential world, training programs are going to become less and less relevant because the most powerful learning is not communicating existing knowledge, it's learning through creating new knowledge. And that occurs in the work environment as you're confronting unexpected situations and forced to come up with new approaches. It forces, I believe, a complete redefinition of what a work environment is. And we've actually done a major piece of research around this. And I should say, by the way, all the topics I'm covering here, we've done quite a bit of research on. Uh, we're unlike many research institutions. We do not charge for our research. So if you're interested in a particular topic or area, happy to share the research with you. But we did a major research initiative around what if we took design thinking and design methodologies that we've applied so successfully to uh, redesigning products, redesigning the customer experience, what if we applied it to ourselves? And what if we took as our primary design goal to redesign the work environment to accelerate learning and performance improvement in the work environment? What would those work environments look like? Not just the physical environment, but the virtual environments, the platforms and IT tools that workers interact with, the management systems, the compensation measurement systems, the entire worker experience. How would we redesign it if our primary design goal was to accelerate learning and performance improvement in the work environment? We actually could not find a single company or institution that has undertaken that task. Huge white space and opportunity. We did find a lot of companies that had done slices of work environment redesign and achieved some interesting goals. Just a quick example, a couple of quick examples. One is a company called LiveOps, which does customer call center operations on an outsourced basis for larger companies. Interesting thing about LiveOps, they actually have no call centers. They have a workforce of 20,000 people, all of whom work from their homes. And they've established a very sophisticated platform to route the right call to the right home at the right time. But in the context of scalable learning, they took inspiration from an online video game called World of Warcraft. For those of you who are familiar with it, every participant in World of Warcraft has a performance dashboard that in real time gives them feedback on how they're doing on multiple dimensions of performance. The founders of LiveOps said, wow, that's really interesting. What if we implemented that for all of our workers? Gave them a real-time performance dashboard. I would suggest that if most traditional institutions implemented those performance dashboards, they would use it as an instrument of punishment. Right? You're falling behind on these three performance metrics. You have six months to get your act together or you're out of here. LiveOps did something very different. 
they encourage the workers who have performance issues to seek help, to ask for help. And they created an online discussion forum where workers could go in and say, you know, I'm having trouble handling this kind of customer call and this performance metric. Does anybody have any suggestions or ideas on how I can improve my performance? And most importantly, LiveOps started to watch, recognize, and reward the workers who are emerging as coaches and helpers of the workers with performance issues. What they were doing was creating a very powerful peer-to-peer -peer learning environment where performance accelerates as workers help each other to get better faster. That's one example. Another example here, I take inspiration from a Silicon Valley entrepreneur by the name of Bill Joy. Uh, one day he made the observation, he said, you know, look, no matter how many smart people you have within your organization, just remember one thing. There are a lot more smart people outside your organization than inside. So if you're serious about scalable learning and just focused on the people within the four walls of your enterprise, you'll never scale learning to the extent of those who reach out systematically and try to connect with expertise outside the institution and build relationships where everybody can learn faster. Fundamentally different mindset and approach. And I will say that we've done quite a bit of research in this area, and our view is the companies that are most sophisticated in this domain, this dimension of scalable learning, are actually not in the West. They're in China and India. Just to give you one quick example of a company in China, not very well known, it's called Li and Feng. Uh, they are in the clothing and apparel industry. Their customers are apparel designers, all the brand names that we know and love in the West. They basically handle everything from sourcing of raw material through all the stages of production, all the logistics. They'll deliver the clothing anywhere in the world that you specify. Interesting thing about Li and Fong, they actually do none of that activity themselves. They operate through a global network of 15,000 business partners truly global, very few of them actually in China, most of them around the world. Interesting thing we learned, we've done quite a bit of research on the company, and we went out and interviewed many of the partners in their network, and we asked them, why are you part of the Li and Feng network? Without exception, without prompting, the answer we got back, because we learn faster as part of the Li and Fung network than we ever could on our own or as part of anyone else's network. I will say I've interviewed many partners of Western companies. I have never once heard that response. Learn faster, we get squeezed harder. And at the same time that Western companies are shrinking the number of participants in their supply networks, why? Scalable efficiency. Li and Fung, with 15,000 partners, every day is adding more partners. Because their belief is the more diverse expertise and capability they have within their network, the faster everyone's going to learn. Again, a completely different mindset, completely different set of relationships built in order to scale learning across a global network. So, reframing innovation, moving beyond product innovation, process, business model, go to the most basic question of all, which is why do we have a large institution? And really challenge this notion of scalable efficiency, and our belief is you're going to need to focus on scalable learning. Huge innovation required to move from scalable efficiency to scalable learning. And it changes everything in the institution if you make that transition, which leads to my third topic, which is rethinking transformation. Transformation is one of the most used words now in the business world. 
I would guarantee virtually every company that I know has a digital transformation program. Yet when I really probe into that digital transformation program, essentially what it's doing is taking digital technology and applying it to do the activities faster and cheaper. Scalable efficiency at its best. I don't believe that's transformation. It's just another wave of e efficiency. Transformation requires rethinking everything. Going back to the most basic question of what business should I really be in? And I've been involved in transformation efforts for many decades. I have only one lesson to share with all of you. And that is, if you believe that transformation is a rational process, if you believe it's about capturing the right data, doing the right analytics, putting it on the right charts, presenting it to the right people, you've already lost. At least in my experience, transformation is not a rational process. It is fundamentally a political process. And it has three objectives, easy to state, difficult to pursue. First objective, identify and neutralize by all means possible the enemies of change. Challenging for many reasons, but one reason is, again, I've been in many leadership meetings around the world. I have never once had an executive stand up in a leadership meeting and announce I am an enemy of change. Everyone sits around the table, they smile and they nod at each other and they say, yes, we need to change. And then they go back into the privacy of their offices to conspire on how to undermine this process of change. So identifying the enemies of change, non-trivial, but necessary, and neutralize them. Second objective, identify and strengthen by all means possible the champions of change. And then there's a third objective, which again is a bit counterintuitive, but I think absolutely essential. And here I take inspiration from a great book I hope many of you have read, certainly recommend it, called The Art of War. One of the key messages in The Art of War is if you have to engage the enemy in battle, you've already lost the war. And the natural temptation, if you get conviction that transformation is essential, you want to go confront the enemy immediately. Do battle, get it over with, move on. Resist that temptation. Postpone confrontation between the enemies of change and the champions of change as long as possible until the enemies have become so weak and the champions so strong that the battle isn't even necessary. It's clear who's going to win. In that context, the traditional approach to transformation is what I call the big bang, top-down approach to transformation. You know, a leader gets up in front of the leadership team and says, we need to change everything. Because we're a large organization, it's going to take a lot of money. Can't do this on a shoestring. And because it's going to be a large organization, it's going to take a long time. Can't do this overnight. But trust me, at the end of that, wonderful things will happen. In my experience, what that person has just done is put a red bullseye on their back and invited the immune system and the antibodies that in my experience exist in every institution to mobilize and crush. A lot of money? Not from my pockets. A long time? I got performance targets for the next quarter. Don't distract me. Never ever underestimate the immune system and the antibodies in large institutions. They're extraordinarily powerful. In that context, we've come to favor an alternative approach to transformation. It's something that we call scaling the edge. In this approach, rather than going in top down into the core of the business to transform it, find an edge in the business 
that has the potential to scale to the point where it could actually become the new core of the business, not just the diversification, not just an innovation initiative. No, it will be the new core of the business. And focus on driving the transformation through the edge rather than the core. Very different approach, and by the way, this ties back to the zoom out, zoom in. Doing a zoom out, zoom in effort can be very helpful in identifying edges that truly have the potential to become the new core of your business. But in our experience, that minimizes the risk of the immune system and the antibodies coming to crush the effort to transform. And over time, pull more and more of the people and resources from the core out to the edge as you scale it. Very different approach. I'll just quickly give an example just to highlight it. I mentioned this company, Li and Fong. They're actually a very old Chinese company, over 100 years old. In their early days, and throughout most of their history, they were basically a deal maker. They connected an apparel designer in the West with a manufacturing operation in China. They wrote it up a deal, collected a commission, and moved on. Two brothers took over the company back in the mid-1970s and saw the, the margins on those commissions shrinking. Said, this is really not sustainable. They basically engaged in, they didn't have the framework at the time, but intuitively they engaged in a zoom out, zoom in exercise. They looked ahead 10 to 20 years to say, what is the global apparel industry going to look like? And what are the unmet needs of the apparel designers? Essentially came up with the idea of an opportunity that they called a trusted advisor. That apparel designers, because of the complexity and change in the global industry, were going to value having a trusted advisor. Completely different business model. They created a new business unit called the Calvin Klein Business Unit. It had three people in it. And their assignment was to go out and live with the Calvin Klein organization, get to know them extremely well, and become more and more helpful to them. Long story short, they tapped into a huge unmet need. They scaled that business unit significantly in a short period of time and they started creating other business units for other apparel designers. That is the core of Li and Fung's business today. And in fact, the remaining deal makers, they couldn't wrap their minds around why would we spend all this time getting to know these apparel, we just want to do the deal and collect the commission. They ended up getting fired. They're no longer with Li and Fung. So I think it's an interesting example of scaling the edge as a way to drive transformation. So I think that um, in a very short time, I've tried at a very high level to cut across the notion of mounting pressure that makes this an imperative, the fact that we're going to need to redefine strategy to go to zoom out, zoom in, Reframe innovation, go back to the most fundamental question of all about our institutions, why do they exist? And then finally, rethink transformation. Avoid the immune system and the antibodies at all costs. Now, I've framed this at the institutional level and I've framed this more in a business context. I just want to go back to one of the things I started with, which was the notion that in a world of mounting performance pressure, there is an emotional impact, and it's the growing amount of fear. And at one level, I think one of the key issues and imperatives for us is, first of all, to recognize that fear. Don't hide it. We live in institutions, by the way, where to admit that you're afraid is a sign of weakness. So very few people are going to say they're afraid. But recognize the fear and focus on how do we move people emotionally from fear to hope and excitement. And I haven't had a chance to go through this in any detail, but I believe that the approaches that I've outlined are a, have a, an ability to address emotional context as well as rational and business context. Just quickly, the zoom out, zoom in, at the emotional level, one of the things it does is focus on opportunity. When you're zooming out, you're identifying a huge opportunity out in the future. 
And one of the problems I see in, in mounting performance pressure is we tend to focus on the threat. We need to change because we're going to die if we don't change. That feeds the fear. Find an opportunity that can inspire and excite people. And then zoom in and find initiatives that you can do in a very short period of time that will build credibility for that opportunity. That this isn't just a fantasy. This is real. This is something we can do if we come together. And I think the notion of making the journey from fear to hope and excitement is ultimately the key to addressing the expanding opportunity that is available, moving from pressure to opportunity. But I just wanted to end, I can't resist. Um, there's a, a quote that I love, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. That was Aristotle, wisdom to be remembered. Thank you very much. <laughs>